Mohammed of Somalia has signed legislation nullifying the recent memorandum of understanding between Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and the President of the Self-Declared Republic of Somaliland, Mursi Bihi Abdi. Somalia says the deal has no legal basis. Ethiopia and Somaliland defended the agreement, which leases about 12.5 miles of sea to Ethiopia in exchange for recognition from Addis Ababa, according to Somaliland officials. On Sunday, the Defense Minister of Somaliland resigned in protest over the deal. Harun Marouf of the Somali Service speaks with Somaliland-based legal expert and analyst Gule Akme Jama about how the accord is being seen on the ground. Ethiopia and Somaliland has been in good relations since 1991. And Ethiopia is a huge economy, one of the fastest growing ones in Horn of Africa and in Africa. It's landlocked and it has a huge population. So Somaliland has been trying to access that economy. But this deal seems unexpected uh, to many observers in here. Because the attempt by Somaliland to convince Ethiopia to use its ports is not news, but to grant military peace to Ethiopia, a powerful neighbor, is not something that was in discussion. So it is it's quite, quite new to Somalilanders. And how is that seen locally? What is the reaction of the population, the elites, the politicians? There is a mixed reaction. The pro-government Supporters, of course, were committed, and there has been some protests organized by the government to support the deal. But there were also other protests that took place in many cities in Somalia. Latest happened in Poroma, which stood against the, the deal. The Minister of, of Defense resigned from the government in protest of the deal. The opposition parties, particularly the main opposition party, also expressed a caution. So there has been a mix of reaction with very strong views against it and government supporters trying to explain why the deal is good for Somalia. And do you think this deal will be implemented? This deal will face a lot of challenges. Uh, first, it will face challenges from the government of Somalia, which will use its diplomatic relations, of course, to pressure Ethiopia to withdraw from the deal. But also there will be some internal challenges. The people who are not happy with this deal, for various reasons, will try to stop it. The opposition demanded the president to table the deal to the parliament. They want the deal to be transparent and the parliament to be able to scrutinize and approve it if it is acceptable and reject it if it is, if it is not acceptable. So the government of Somaliland will have a lot of convincing to do to convince many people, including the opposition, that this deal is good for Somalia. And the Somali government nullified the deal. It argues it's illegal and it considers Somaliland as part of Somalia. You are a lawyer. Do you think they are right or wrong? This is very interesting. Why? This issue is very common in unrecognized states. In 1991, the government of Somalia has lost the effective control over the territory of Somalia. That's when Somaliland declared independence from Somalia. But under the international system, Somalia is the recognized state. So the entire international community still holds Somalia as a legitimate government. Nonetheless, Somaliland is the one that has effective control, which means what happens internally in Somalia uh, is controlled by the government of Somalia. And that challenge where you have the government with the recognition, with international legitimacy there, contesting the legality of the government that has the effective control of Somalia in this case, but doesn't have the recognition. And that's where the contestation is taking place. Gule Ahmed Jama is a Somaliland-based legal expert and analyst. He spoke from the Somaliland capital, Hargisa, with Haru Marouf of the Somalia Service. There was yet another problem with the Democratic Republic of Congo's December 20 presidential and parliamentary elections. The country's electoral commission, also known as SENI, declared ineligible a total of 82 candidates, including three government ministers and four governors, due to fraud. Reporter al Katati Sabiti Jaffa is in the eastern DRC city of Goma. He tells me the latest development has raised more uncertainty about Congolese voters. The Electoral Commission sought out yesterday a long communique in which 82 candidates were disqualified because of electoral fraud. 
among them 80 uh, members of Union Sacre, which is the political platform supporting President Tshisekedi. One of them is the governor of the capital city of DRC, the city of Kinshasa, and three of them are ministers. According to this report, uh, Jaffa, they are disqualified because of fraud. What kind of fraud do you think uh, they might have been engaged in? Most of them are accused of having hijacked voting machines and facilitating false votes in their favor. Others are accused of using ballot staffing in their electoral district. And you must know that 15 of 26 provinces of DRC are concerned by this problem because these people are from different provinces. We know already the uh, DRC election had some problems. So with these disqualifications, how would this impact the rest of the electoral process? This situation had impacted negatively the electoral process uh, because now we have a lot of clashes on social media, on media between candidates and the electoral commission. And as I said before, most of them are from... So people and opponents are asking now, if CENI, the Electoral Commission, accepts now as there was some people who did fraud, who did they vote for the president as they are all uh, Tshisekedi supporters? And even between Tshisekedi supporters, we also found many clashes on social media and even on normal media. So this had impacted negatively the process because the Electoral Commission had to announce the results of the parliament at the national level two days ago, but they didn't because of this problem. And we don't know how CENI will resolve it and what will be after this, because now all opponents can get a way to charge the government and CENI to do not be serious when organizing this election. That was reporter Jaffa al speaking with us from Goma in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The Dangote Group has expressed readiness to assist Nigeria's Economic and Financial Crimes Commission in its investigations following the commission's visit to the company's headquarters on January 4th. The group said it was cooperating with the commission which is investigating the possible misuse of foreign exchange from the central bank. According to a statement by the manufacturing conglomerate, it received a letter from the anti-craft agency on December 6. The letter, which was reportedly sent to the other conglomerates, is said to have requested for details of every foreign exchange allocated by the Central Bank of Nigeria from 2014 till date. The company says despite sending a fast batch of documents to the body officers insisted on visiting the group's headquarters. Dangote said at the moment no accusations of wrongdoing had been made against any company within the group. The former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin M. Fiel, who was appointed in 2014, was removed from office last June. Leaders of Cameroon's main opposition party say they are negotiating with more than 30 opposition leaders to present a single candidate in the next election should 91-year-old President Paul Beer be incapacitated by ill health. The opposition reacted after Bia, who has ruled for more than four decades, made no mention of running for re-election in New Year's message. Maurice Kamto, president of the Cameroon Racism's Movement Party, said scores of civil society and political opposition members have set up a platform called the Political Alliance for Change, also known as the PAC, to place for Bia to relinquish power. The 91-year-old has been president since 1982 and is the world's oldest political head of state. 
presidential elections are to take place in Cameroon by October 2025. But civil society groups and opposition parties expected Biya to announce during his New Year's message early elections in 2024. That didn't happen. Come to say he has been chosen by the PAC as a single opposition candidate, should Biya resign or is incapacitated. He said supporters of Biya's CPDM party who are fed up with Biya's autocratic rule should join the PAC. The PAC remains open to all those who believe that the current regime is now Cameroon's problem and therefore can no longer contribute anything to its recovery, said Kamto. Our compatriots in the ruling CPDM party who demonstrate a patriotic reawakening are also welcome in the PAC. Let them come and take their place in the train of national renaissance. Come to say he would revive all state institutions he said Bia has ruined, organized and inclusive national dialogue to end the separatist crisis that has claimed more than 6,000 lives in Cameroon's western regions and improve living conditions for those stuck in hunger and poverty. According to Cameroon's constitution, if Bia dies, resigns or becomes incapacitated, Marcel Niat the 89-year-old president of the Senate, the upper house of parliament, would take power and organize elections for a new president within 120 days. In his message, Bia did not say anything about plans to leave power or not, but blamed the country's current hardships and armed conflict on high levels of corruption and external factors. Bia said Cameroon, like other African countries, is dealing with an economic crisis caused by the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. Bia said when the world expected an end to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the resurgency last October of the Israel-Palestinian conflict worsened lifts in the international community and further sunk the world's economy. Bia said the Israel-Palestinian conflict is leading to price hikes in consumer products and consequently the cost of living. He said the conflict is also causing shortages of petroleum products. Despite the challenges, Bia said Cameroon had a 3.7% economic growth rate in 2023 and inflation was contained at less than 70%. Cameroon's opposition disputed that, saying the economic growth rate is less than 2% and inflation is running above 20%. They say Bia is responsible for what they say is an economic disaster in Cameroon, a country blessed with a variety of minerals that could be exploited to develop the country, to develop Central African state, but were misused by the Bia government.